So in the previous video, we dealt with the fact that in the movie Free Guy, Guy is a program, a character in a video game, but he doesn't even know it. That's why in Gematria, the practice of coding numbers into words, Free Guy synchronizes with life as a game, because this movie is a message. Not only that, his name is Guy, which is extremely vague, but it's to illustrate that he doesn't know who he is, he's just a guy. So if you watch my previous breakdown, you realize that just like Guy, you don't know who you are, and you represent Guy. But the Bible says greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. So who is in you? God. Therefore you are God, lowercase g. And your conscience is leading you through this unwinnable game. But there's another aspect of this movie that we have to discuss. Guy is a non-playable character. An NPC. And guess what? Most likely, you are too. Because regular people are NPCs. Why? Because you don't know who you are. Why are you here? Uh, I don't know! Why are you here? Uh, why are you here? I don't know why I'm here. You accept bullshit and your bullshit ass life because you don't know who you are. So you're allowing your wallet to define you, your job to define you, or your current circumstances to give you definition. But you are the guy. You are God. You are the highest manifestation of God on earth. And they have reduced you to a blind, obedient worker. No different than a slave. Therefore making you an NPC, a non-playable character. And this is why they called him Blue Shirt Guy in this movie. There he is, Blue Shirt Guy. Blue Shirt, yes. Because he's a blue collar worker, making bullshit money. Not only that, he works for the bank. I've lived here in Free City my whole life. I've got a best friend, I've got a goldfish, and I work at the bank. What more could a guy want? And why does he work at the bank? Because in reality, we all work for the bank. Page 192 in the book The Creature from Jekyll Island by Edward G. Griffin. It is not necessary that you work directly for the bank, no matter where you earn the money. Its origin was a bank and its ultimate destination is a bank. The loop through which it travels can be large or small, but the fact remains, all interest is paid eventually by human effort, and significance of that fact is even more startling than the assumption that not enough money is created to pay back the interest. It is that the total of the human effort ultimately is for the benefit of those who create fiat money. It is a form of modern serfdom, in which the great mass of society works as indentured servants to a ruling class of financial nobility. You're what we call an NPC. NPC? That the policeman and the muscular bunny rabbit they call me that what is an npc just watch everybody get down on the ground nobody trying to be a hero this will all be over soon i don't understand you're a non-player character <laughs> a background person someone designed to make the game more fun for real people the game begins when the Federal Reserve allows the commercial banks to create checkbook money out of nothing. The banks derive profit from this easy money, not by spending it, but by lending it to others and collecting interest. In the vocabulary of the common man, to borrow is to accept a loan of something that already exists. He is confused, therefore, when the banker issues money out of nothing and then says he is lending it. He appears to be lending, but in reality, he is creating. I need to borrow a month. What's the interest? Today's rate, 30%. I can't pay it back. We can always come to some arrangement. 
It is important to remember that banks do not really want to have their loans repaid, except as evidence of the dependability of the borrower. They make a profit from interest on the loan, not repayment of the loan. If the loan is paid off, the bank merely has to find another borrower, and that can be an expensive nuisance. It is much better to have an existing borrower pay only the interest and never payments on the loan itself. The process is called rolling over the debt. One of the reasons banks prefer to lend to governments is that they do not expect those loans to ever be repaid. You can never get out of debt in a usury system with a built-in shortage of money. Did you hear me? Now watch. Uh, let's say you're going to buy a house. Let's say that house is $150,000. And let's say current rate today is 7%. You do understand that by the end of that 30-year mortgage, you will have paid for a $150,000 house $360,000. You, you do understand that. So let me ask you a question. You bought a house for $150,000. Why did you buy it for $150,000? Watch me, because that's what it was worth. Why didn't you pay $360,000 for your house? Because your house is not worth $360,000. So let me ask you a question. Why are you paying $200,000 more for your $150,000 house than it's worth? Because you're caught in a system that tells you you have to. Because you don't see any way out. And the world, if you were of the world, would love you. But you are not of this world and they hate you. I understand you can't go out tomorrow and pay cash for your house. I understand that. But I'm a little bit tired of people shouting, Hallelujah, the bank approved me for a loan. They approved to use you. And how must they feel to sit back and say, okay, I got this thing. I got this thing worth $150,000 <laughs> and they paid me $360,000 for it. When we go to a lender, either a bank or a private party, and receive a loan of money, we are willing to pay interest on a loan in recognition of the fact that the money we are borrowing is an asset which we want to use. It seems only fair to pay a rental fee for the asset to a person who owns it. It's not easy to acquire an automobile, and it's not easy to acquire money, real money that is. If the money we are borrowing was earned by someone's labor and talent, they are fully entitled to receive interest on it. But what are we to think of money that is created by a mere stroke of a pen or a click of a computer key? Why should anyone collect a rental fee on that? Four minutes for a cup of coffee? Yesterday it was three. You want coffee or you want to reminisce? Two coffees. Page 55. We can guard against theft and loss by keeping cash in a home safe or in the bank safe. We can shield cash from lawsuits by purchasing insurance. But can we protect our cash from confiscation by governments, either physically through taxation, outright seizure, or through inflation? Inflation is one of those things that the average person does not understand. Simply put, inflation means that dollars are worth less now than they were before. A dollar buys less today than it did yesterday. This means that prices increase to accommodate the lower worth of the dollar. Date. Two hours. It's always been an hour. Well, now it's two. Price went up. Since when? Since today. Everyone needs to understand that inflation doesn't just happen. It is created by the government. The savings and loan industry is really a cartel within a cartel. It could not function without Congress standing by to push unlimited amounts of money into it. And Congress could not do that without the banking cartel called the Federal Reserve System standing by as a lender of last resort to create money out of nothing for Congress to borrow. This comfortable arrangement between political scientists and monetary scientists permits Congress to vote for any scheme it wants, regardless of the cost. If politicians try to raise that money through taxes, they will be thrown out of office. But being able to borrow it through the Federal Reserve System upon demand allows them to collect it through the hidden mechanism of inflation, and not one voter in a hundred will complain. Slugworth, Fickle Gruber, and Prodnose have been in cahoots for years. A sort of chocolate cartel, if you will. They've been watering down their chocolate and storing the excess in a secret vault deep beneath the cathedral, guarded round the clock by a corrupt cleric and 500 chocoholic monks. 
The only way in is down a secret elevator and past the Mistress of the Keys, a subterranean sentinel who hasn't seen sunlight in years. There's thousands of gallons of chocolate down there, and the cartel use it to bribe, blackmail, and bludgeon the competition. The purpose of meeting on Jekyll Island was not to hunt ducks. Simply stated, it was to come to agreement on the structure and operation of a banking cartel. The goal of the cartel, as is true with all of them, was to maximize profits by minimizing competition between members, to make it difficult for new competitors to enter the field, and to utilize the police power of government to enforce the cartel agreement. In more specific terms, the purpose and indeed the actual outcome of the meeting was to create the blueprint for the Federal Reserve System. We want you to send Wonka a message. Backed up by physical force. That if he attempts to sell chocolate in this town again, he is liable to meet with a little accident. The composition of the Jekyll Island meeting was a classic example of cartel structure. A cartel is a group of independent businesses which join together to coordinate the production, pricing, or marketing of their members. The purpose of a cartel is to reduce competition and thereby increase profitability. This is accomplished through a shared monopoly over the industry, which forces the public to pay higher prices for their goods or services than would otherwise require it on a free enterprise competition. He's good. Too good. And what's more, he only charges a sovereign a chocolate, so anyone can afford them. Even the... you know, the... The poor? As with all cartels, it had to be created by legislation and sustained by the power of government under the deception of protecting the consumer. The most important task before them, therefore, can be stated as objective number five, how to convince Congress that the scheme was a measure to protect the public. The task was a delicate one. The American people did not like the concept of a cartel. The idea of business enterprises joining together to fix prices and prevent competition was alien to the free enterprise system. It could never be sold to the voters. But if the word cartel was not used, if the venture could be described with words which are mostly neutral, perhaps even alluring, then half the battle would be won. The first decision, therefore, was to follow the practice adopted in Europe. Henceforth, the cartel will operate as a central bank, and even that was to be but a generic expression. For purposes of public relations and legislation, they would devise a name that would avoid the word bank altogether, and which would conjure the image of the federal government itself. To sell the plan to Congress, the cartel reality had to be hidden, and the name Central Bank had to be avoided. The word Federal was chosen to make it sound like it was a government operation. The word Reserve was chosen to make it appear financially sound. And the word System, the first draft used the word Association, was chosen to conceal the fact that it was a Central Bank. The words United States of America were to appear on the face of every note, along with the great seal of the United States Treasury, and of course, the signature of the treasurer himself would be printed in a conspicuous location. All of this was designed to convince the public that the new institution was surely an agency of the government itself. Watch this. Here's how it works. They print it, we borrow it, and we pay them interest. This is a private company privately held they cannot get they have to pay for postage stamps they are that far away from the federal government this is an independent corporation and group of bankers so when you hear the news say the fed decided that the interest rate will go up how do how do they get to decide They get to decide because in 1913, Woodrow Wilson, he was elected, he was inaugurated in January of 1913. In December of 1913, he signed the Federal Reserve Act, bringing the Federal Reserve System into place in America and did what Thomas Jefferson said must never happen. He took the control of the money away from the people by taking it away from the Congress and gave it to a group of private individuals who have to pay taxes on the money they loaned the government. The bottom line is that Congress and the banking cartel have entered into a partnership in which the cartel has the privilege of collecting interest on money which it creates out of nothing, a perpetual override on every American dollar that exists in the world. Congress, on the other hand, has access to unlimited funding without having to tell the voters that taxes are being raised through the process of inflation. If you understand this paragraph, you understand the Federal Reserve System. 
Now at the end of the movie of Free Guy, the system was overturned and the NPCs, the non-playable characters, these background people that were working their life away, no longer had to. Now listen why. <laughs> Buddy, I missed you. So where's the bank? There is no bank. So what do we do? Whatever we want. And that's the point. The bank is your oppressor. And that's the sole reason why you don't do the things that you want to do. The things that motivate you or the things that inspire you to follow your purpose or your calling in life. Because you're too busy working a job to pay off your debt. This isn't by accident. This is by design. Working long hours and amassing debt are other activities encouraged by materialistic values that must surely involve little in the way of intrinsic satisfaction. As noted by Juliet Shore, contemporary United States culture leads many to work a great deal of overtime and go deeply into debt in order to afford the lifestyle the culture says conveys success and happiness. The price of overwork and debt is stress. It is difficult for Americans to come to grips with the fact that their total money supply is backed by nothing but debt, and it is even more mind-boggling to visualize that if everyone paid back all that was borrowed, there will be no money left in existence. That's right, there will be not one penny in circulation. All coins and all paper currency will be returned back to bank vaults, and there will be not one dollar in anyone's checking account. In short, all money would disappear. With the knowledge that the money in America is based on debt, it should not come as a surprise to learn that the Federal Reserve System is not in the least interested in seeing the reduction of debt in this country, regardless of the public utterance to the contrary. Here is the bottom line of the system's own publication. The Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia says, a large and growing number of analysts, on the other hand, now regard the national debt as something useful, if not an actual blessing. They believe the national debt need not to be reduced at all. Why do you think there are time zones? Why do you think taxes and prices go up the same day in the ghetto? The cost of living keeps rising to make sure people keep dying. How else could there be men with a million years while most live day to day? As pointed out in the previous section, that is essentially the situation which exists today. Every dollar of our currency and checkbook money was created by the act of lending. If all debt were repaid, our entire money supply would vanish back into the inkwells and computers. The national debt is the principal foundation upon which money is created for private debt. To pay off or greatly reduce the national debt would cripple our monetary system. No politician would dare to advocate that, even if surplus funds were available in the Treasury. The Federal Reserve System, therefore, has virtually locked our nation into perpetual debt. Flooding the wrong zone with a million years. It could cripple the system. Let's hope so. The Federal Reserve System is a legal private monopoly of the money supply, operated for the benefit of the few, under the guise of protecting and promoting the public interest. Is that so? You might upset the balance for a generation. Two. But don't fool yourself. In the end, nothing will change. Because everyone wants to live forever. They all think they have a chance at immortality, even though all the evidence is against it. They all think they will be the exception. But the truth is, for a few to be immortal, many must die. 